I'm Michelle. And I'm Lucy. Welcome to another episode of Tutoriferous. Today is a cameo episode. These are very short episodes, and they will be slotted in between the other ones, and they will cover people who made a fleeting yet tantalizing appearance in other episodes. We don't always have a lot of information about them, so they can't really have their full episode of their own, but they are too interesting to abandon completely, and they fill in the gaps and enable us to create as full a picture of the era as we can. And today, Gavin Douglas. Gavin Douglas, And yes. by his name, where is he from? Everybody, quick quiz. <laughs> <laughs> well, we came across this man in Margaret Tudor's episode when he was helping his relative, Archibald Douglas, Earl of Angus. Earl of Angus. Margaret's horrible husband. Angus. In his bid for power. Is he as bad as his, as his brother? No. Okay, good. Well. Uh-oh. <laughs> uh, well, Angus, Angus was bad because of the way he, he treated he, Margaret. Before, he treated Margaret. I think yeah. that's the main... Thing where obviously Gavin hasn't got this yes. that side of it. Yeah. Well, I then came across him in the wee small hours of the morning, as I was listening to the History of the English Language podcast. Oh, did he just show up in your home as a ghost? <laughs> he showed up in my ears as I was listening. <laughs> <laughs> where he appeared in his capacity as one of Scotland's major poets of the Middle Scots language. Really. Yeah, I was just lying there in the dark listening, and I suddenly thought, hang on a minute, that's Gavin Douglas. (laughs) Didn't even know he was a poet. Do they read some of his poetry? (laughs) Yeah, Which episode is that? Um, Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. It was called Something to Do with Uniting. I'll put put a link to it. Okay. On the thing when I've looked up what it is. Yeah, you caught me me on the hop there. I can't remember what it was called. (laughs) Yeah, and this fact that he was a poet it completely passed me by when I researched the episode for Margaret. It was never mentioned in any of Margaret's books. And he was responsible for the first coining of a word we use often these days, especially when we hear about the exploits of the Tudors. But I'm not going to tell you what the word is until the end, but it's, it's worth waiting for. Okay. Gavin, or Gawain Douglas, they're the that same name. That makes more sense. Yeah, Gavin and Gawain are the same name. He was born in around 1474 in Tantalon Castle, which still looks really impressive today. It's only a ruin, but it's right on the sea of the east coast of Scotland. So it looks, looks really good. We're going to have to assume he was born around 1474 because we have an application to the Vatican for Gavin to be granted a canonry or prebend and to get the money from it. Oh. And the document states that he was 13 in 1489 which seems far too young to be made a canon. Uh, yes. <laughs> he was the third son of Archibald, Earl of Angus, and so the youngest son, so inevitably he entered the church. And that's obviously not the Archibald that married Margaret Tudor. Gavin, Gavin was Archibald's uncle. Oh. His life can be looked at in two halves. There's before Flodden and after Flodden. Before Flodden, he concentrated on his academic, literary and church works. He attended St Andrew's University in Edinburgh, where he became a licentiati. Okay, not licentious. No, (laughs) That's where I thought you were going. (laughs) Probably. He was a student. (laughs) (laughs) It's a Master of Arts, so an advanced academic qualification. Okay. This meant studying a lot of Aristotle, mainly, I think. He then may have studied in Paris, but I'm not sure why we think that. I know why I think it, because I read it in a book, but I don't know why the author of the book thought that. He then went through the usual ecclesiastical career path of parson, rector, and then became dean of the Church of St Giles in Edinburgh in 1501. His literary career put him in contact with, amongst others, Polydor Virgil and Thomas Wolsey. Yeah. We're going to have to have a noise for Thomas Woolsey, sort of the opposite of Margaret Beaufort's. <laughs> yes. <Blah>. Yeah. <laughs> he belonged to a group of poets known as the Makars. M-A-K-A-R-S. I haven't heard of them. No, which also included William Dunbar, whom we mentioned in Margaret's episode, being shocked at the lax morals yes. of James IV's court. They wrote in Middle Scots, and it was his poetry for which he's best remembered except by people doing history podcasts who did not to know anything about it. (laughs) Apart from Chaucer, Gavin Douglas is the best documented poet of this 
early era. Really? The Maycars are often referred to as the Scottish Chaucerians. And Maycar means maker and derives from the fact that the Greek for poet was the word for maker. And the word has recently been brought back for the official National Poet of Scotland. Ah. Gavin is now known for just four poems, one of which we're not entirely sure was by him. And they are The Palace of Honour, which is a dream allegory. And if you're thinking of something like a sonnet, no, it's 2,000 lines long. Oh, dear. It's about a poet who slanders the court of Venus and he's later forgiven, but then passes on to the palace in a courtly love romance sort of way. And it was dedicated to James IV, who was a great patron of poets. Hmm. And there was a poem called Conscience, which is a really odd sounding, quite short poem about a man who cuts the con from conscience and is then left with science. And then the C, C, C SCI, falls off and he's just left with ends, which sounds quite surreal <laughs> from, yeah. from medieval poem. I'm not sure where it, where it was going with that. King Hart is the next one, H-A-R-T, and that's the dodgy one. We're not entirely sure it's by him. And it's nothing less than all human life told in an allegory of King Hart, meaning your heart, beating heart, in his castle, surrounded by his five courtiers, which are the senses, and the Queen, Pleasance and Foresight. So this is a lovely... They loved a good allegory, didn't yes. they? If they could shoehorn anything into an allegory, <laughs> they would do so. <laughs> His most famous work was the Eniardos, which was his translation of Virgil's Aeneas. And it's considered to be one of the most important works of the Middle Scots period. Oh. This, this was the first translation of its kind to be made in an Anglic language. And I looked up Angli Anglic language. I could only find Proto-Anglic, which included Early and Middle Scots, Middle English, Northumbrian, Old English and Metropolitan Early Modern English. Oh. So he's the first out of all that lot to do a vernacular translation of an ancient classic. Hmm. The first lines are from a prologue in praise of Virgil himself. In modern English, they read, quote, Laudatory praise, honour and infinite thanks to you and your pleasant, ornate, fresh composition, most revered Virgil, Prince of Latin Poets, gem of intellect and fluid of eloquence, wow. peerless pearl, patron of poetry, rose, register, palm, laurel and glory, chosen, precious stone, chief flower and cedar tree, lantern, lodestar, mirror and per se, master of masters, sweet sauce and springing well, wide where our awe rings your heavenly bell, I mean your crafty curious work, so quick, lusty and most skilful with sentences, Pleasing, perfect and smooth in all degrees, as any material held before our eyes, in every volume which you wish to write, far surmounting all other manner of composition, like the rose in June, with her sweet smell, the marigold or daisy does excel, unquote. That's, that's all one sentence. And it sounds as if it's gone through Google Translate, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he just pulled out of the source and started yes. saying words. Wow. Wrote, wrote all the words on a piece of paper, tore it all up and threw it in the air and then picked it up again. <laughs> yeah. Well, obviously that thing went, went down very well in uh, medieval Scotland. <laughs> huh. He did nearly all his writing when he was Dean of St Giles. Later, I don't know if he didn't have the time or the inclination, but his literary career definitely took a back seat. Maybe after the disaster that was Flodden, literature didn't seem quite so very important to him anymore. Or maybe it was because, thanks to his nephew, the Douglases were right in the thick of things. His nephew, Archibald, Earl of Angus. He now felt that his role should, should be more political in nature. He wasn't his, abandoning his ecclesiastical career, though. In fact, you know, always look on the bright side of life, quite a number of the clergy were killed at Flodden. How is that the bright side? Well, James the Fourth's illegitimate son Alexander had been made Bishop of St Andrews when he was about 11, I seem to remember. This left several openings for a certain ambitious Dean of St Giles. <sighs> Lots of lovely jobs going. One of the first things Margaret did as regent was to nominate Gavin as Archbishop of St Andrews. OK, do we know how they met? Um, presumably through Archibald. I would think so, but 
Where? Where? She seemed to prefer Gavin to Archibald. (laughs) I think I can understand why. Yes. Well, she she said she had a particular affection for him since he was there to offer comfort and advice after James's death. So it does actually imply that she met him first. Yes, it does. But in a bizarre turn of events that I know nothing about apart from this, I couldn't find out anything else, the prior of St Andrews expelled Gavin and was then himself expelled. And Gavin was then left without a living since he's resigned his previous posts when he was nominated Archbishop of St Andrews. He counted his chickens before Before they hatched, hatched, I think, yes. Look what I can do. Yes, the reasoning behind Gavin's expulsion may have been that he had become part of a plot to get Margaret and young James out of Scotland to the English Ah. court that, that we heard about in her episode. Yeah. Generally, dioceses don't much care for archbishops who are conspiring with a foreign power. Right. He did manage to get the bishopric of Dunkeld, but only after quite a battle. Margaret appealed to the Pope on his behalf and was backed up by Henry VIII. And he also became one of the Lords of the Council, which gave him a fair amount of clout in the running of affairs. Mm -hmm. The marriage of Margaret and Angus put the Douglases firmly on the English side against Albany for the French side, at least initially. As we know, they swapped sides constantly. Uh, We heard that Angus was nagged into marrying Margaret by his grandfather, and it may be that Gavin had a hand in it too. As immediately after Flodden, he was on a small council which acted as personal advisor to Margaret. It's not beyond the scope of imagination that he might have advised her to marry that nice young man, Archibald Douglas, who purely coincidentally happened to be his nephew. Hmm. It was Gavin who was sent to the council to tell them that Margaret still intended to be regent and was told, no, she knew the deal. (laughs) She can't be regent if she's married. She got married. She broke the rules. And while you're about it, Bishop Gavin, we'd like our great seal back that you and your nephew took by force from the Archbishop of Glasgow. (gasps) Really? (laughs) Yeah. But he can't have handed it over since that September. He was acting as Chancellor, which he couldn't have done if he hadn't had the seal. (laughs) And I say acting as Chancellor because I'm not sure that anybody made him Chancellor. (laughs) Because the only one who could have done would have been Margaret and she had just been told she couldn't be Regent. So people just seem to say, no, I'm going to be Chancellor. What are you going to do about it? Yeah. Stop me. (laughs) However, when Albany returned to Scotland from France, Gavin was in for a nasty shock. Albany didn't trust Gavin and his links with Henry VIII. Oh, really? Hmm, I wonder why. Yes, don't trust anyone with links with Henry VIII. And so he arranged that letters, including papal bulls passing through England to Scotland via Lord Dacre, should be intercepted. And July the 4th, 1515, a batch of letters were taken off an English messenger and taken to Albany... One of these letters revealed that Pope Leo X was all in favour of revoking the tradition whereby the Archbishop of St Andrews was guardian to the young king in his minority. Instead, he favoured the Bishop of Dunkeld to be James's guardian, who just happens to be Gavin Douglas. Not only that, but the letter revealed that the people who had written to the Pope suggesting this change were Henry VIII and Queen Margaret. Ah, Gavin was brought before Albany and accused of being promoted for the bishopric by Henry rather than by the Scottish Council. Gavin denied this, saying that if he was found guilty, he would, quote, be content that my said lord should cut off my head, unquote, which is a dangerous (laughs) request. I'm not sure I'd be willing to say that. No, especially since however much he might deny it, Albany has the letters. (laughs) And he was accused of buying the bishopric from the Pope. Of course. Yeah, I just thought they all did that. (laughs) He was imprisoned in Edinburgh Castle, amongst other places. All in all, he was a prisoner for a year before the Pope managed to get him released by hitting Albany with ecclesiastical punishments. (laughs) Ecclesiastical (laughs) sticks or something. (laughs) Just by hitting him. By that time, Margaret was in England and Gavin somehow managed to patch things up with Albany and even got his bishopric back. Although Margaret included Albany's treatment of Gavin Douglas in her list of grievances against Albany that he told, she told Henry about. Whereas it seems to me that Albany behaved decently yeah. all the time. Yeah. 
I mean, apart from throwing his hat into the fire, that seemed to be the only bit of bad behaviour you ever hear from Albany. And they were his own hats. I mean, it's not as if he was throwing other people's hats into the fire. <laughs> <laughs> the following year, Gavin travelled to France with Albany, ostensibly to negotiate the Treaty of Rouen, which renewed the old alliance and arranged for the marriage between James V and Francis I's daughter. And that's what I read. That's that's that I read. That's what he'd gone for. But in fact, I later read, Albany took with him some of the members of several of the most powerful families in Scotland to ensure good behaviour back home while he was away. Hostages. Hostages. So, yeah, Gavin was taken to try and lure the Douglases from Henry and towards France. It would be an awful pity if something were to happen to your uncle, wouldn't oh, it? Oh, sorry. You know what happens when people try and cross the channel, don't you? They fall overboard. <laughs> <laughs> and somehow there's this handy-dandy rock in their pockets. <laughs> we kept telling him not to put rocks in his pocket, but, you know, <laughs> he wouldn't he would do listen. it. He wouldn't listen. He thought they were good luck. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Following this trip to France, the relationship between Gavin and Margaret seems to have soured. She complained that he had tried to get her to revoke the agreement she had made with Angus, her husband, whereby he wouldn't be allowed to take any of her dowry or landed possessions without her permission. So Angus Gavin is trying to get, get her to say, go on, let him, let him take your stuff. No. Whether that was because he joined Team France and so had no more need of Margaret and Henry, or whether it was due to Margaret's intention to divorce his nephew, I'm not sure. But Angus had already deprived Margaret of revenues of worth 4,000 marks a year. And Gavin was pressing for... He'd done that illegally and Gavin was pressing for the law to be changed so he could do it legally. So it's not surprising Margaret fell out with him. No, not at all. Also, by the time Gavin had got back from Scotland, the Earl of Arran had had Angus arrested because he was afraid that Angus was becoming too powerful and had control of James, little James V. And it happened like this. Albany had left three people in... Yeah, Albany had... Everyone begins with A all of a sudden. <laughs> Albany had left three people in charge while he was away in France. Aaron, Angus, and a French nobleman called Antoine Darcy. They do all begin with A. But Darcy was murdered by one of the Hume family. And Lord Hume was the one who was very anti-Margaret, but then Albany snubbed him in some way and he suddenly instantly went over to Margaret's side. This triggered a diplomatic incident and the council decided to put Aaron in charge. Aaron had his eye on the regent job himself, and this led to a pitch battle within the city of Edinburgh between Aaron and Angus, which we covered in Margaret's episode. But at that time, we, I hadn't heard what this battle was called. It was called Cleanse the Causeway, which sounds very Trumpian, doesn't it? Yes, it does. <laughs> I wondered if that people were shouting, sort of inanely, Cleanse the Causeway. Yeah. On hearing of Aaron's plan to arrest him, Angus sent his uncle Gavin to mediate with him. Gavin found that Aaron and his party were armed and intent on the fight. Even the Archbishop of Glasgow was wearing a, a coat of chain mail under his ecclesiastical robes. Gavin went back to Angus with the news and then went off to pray. It's, it's times like this, it actually seems quite handy being the third son destined for the church because when it all gets a bit nasty, you, you can, can just leave for a quick pray, yes. And people aren't shocked because they think well that's what he's there for at this point margaret was siding with albany to try to bring down her husband angus and gavin were forced to flee to the borders and gavin then went on to london where he was to ask for aid against albany and while he was there he was to drop one or two hints that margaret and albany were lovers what do we think that that's actually a thing no okay i don't think so i don't think so darn <laughs> and it could be, it could be for all we know, but I get the impression not. And we heard in Margaret's episode how furious she had been with her brother that he believed someone like Gavin Douglas over her own word. Yeah. She accused Gavin of making, quote, false and evil reports, unquote. And when you think that she and Gavin had been very close after James's death, it's obvious that their relationship had taken something of a nosedive. Mm. Oh. Apart from being Margaret's lover... Gavin pinned several other grievances on Albany. Oh. He'd garrisoned French troops in Scottish castles. He'd sold off Crown Land. He'd sold three ships to the French Navy for half their worth. 
He'd traded in benefices and had stolen royal possessions, including silver jugs, tapestries and robes. And by far the worst of this was that when he was in Rome, Albany had petitioned the Pope to grant the divorce between Margaret and Angus, which we know he did do by Margaret's request, but that he had done it so that he could marry Margaret himself. Oh! Yes. So Gavin is dripping all this poison into Henry VIII's ear. And Henry listens to the last person he spoke to. Yep. He believed it all and sent a letter to Scotland detailing all Gavin's accusations and adding that he suspected that Albany planned to take the kingdom of Scotland for himself and that he, Henry, feared for young King James's life. Gavin was then prevented from going back to Scotland, which is not surprising after that diatribe. I wouldn't risk going back. While he was away, he'd had his bishopric stripped Bishop Rick, oh, this is very difficult. He'd had his Bishop Rick stripped from him. <laughs> <laughs> and as compensation for all his slander against her, Margaret was given the revenues from that Bishop Rick. Ooh. Which made up some, some of the way the fact that Gavin's nephew had nicked all her money. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Also, the Bishop of Glasgow, whose life he'd saved in the Cleanse the Causeway incident, was in his turn slandering Gavin whom he saw as a potential rival for the nomination of the Archbishop of St Andrews. And I'm not sure why he saw him as a rival. If Gavin had been deprived of his role of Bishop of Dunkeld... How could he be? He was hardly going to be offered the, a better bishopric. Yeah. Also, following the deal Angus made with Albany and Margaret, which meant that he would be exiled rather than executed, Gavin seems to have fallen out with Angus. So exiled rather than executed. Yeah. OK. Mar Margaret put in a good word for her horrible husband, and said, no, no, don't kill him, just just send him away. In a letter to Wolsey, Gavin called his nephew, quote, the unworthy Earl of Angus, unquote. He seems to have fallen out with everybody at this point. Oh. But the upshot of all this was that he was forced to stay in England. Well, I suppose at least the beer was better, wasn't it, from what we've heard? <laughs> <laughs> and it was while he was in England that Gavin became friends with Polydor Virgil. And... It was also while he was in England that in 1522 he caught the plague and died. I think that's the first one we've had that's died that's of plague. That's actually died of plague, yeah. What a way to yeah. go. Ugh. Yeah. He was buried in the Church of the Savoy and he has a bin named after him in Queen's Park in Glasgow. A bin. A bin. Like a garbage bin. Yep. It's got his name on and everything. Okay. As for the word that he coined, uh, that yes. I mentioned at the beginning of the episode... In Book 6 of the Enneados, Aeneas travels to the underworld, and Douglas's prologue to that book contains the following passage. Quote, it is but ghosts and frightful fantasies, benevolent goblins and scary phantoms fill this book. Out of these wandering spirits, wow, you cried, unquote. And that is the first documented use of the, of word, the word wow. wow. Yes. Really? And wow can be found in Scots after that. But it didn't become popular in English until the 1900s. Huh. And that comes from Gavin. That's cool. Yeah. That's what I was listening to in the wee small hours of the morning. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> this early Tudor period is probably about the time when English and Scots diverged the most. Because Scots hadn't been nearly as affected by Norman French or by the great vowel shift. Oh, and so yeah. if the two languages had carried on the paths that they were travelling on, they could have ended up as two completely different languages. Yeah. But then Elizabeth died without an heir, and James I and VI took the throne. And brought that language with them. Yeah. Yeah, so English and Scots began to converge again. Huh. And that is the story of Gavin Douglas, general busybody, and, unbeknownst to me, incredibly famous poet. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, I was. Yes, it's funny when you're sort of half asleep, dozing slightly, and then you suddenly think, "Hang on, Gavin Douglas." <laughs> <laughs> now I'm wide awake. <laughs> yes. That's yeah. really neat. Hmm. And that's where Wow comes from. Hold on, I want to look them up. No, that's poems of Lord Alfred Douglas. Ah, Bosey. Yeah, that's what comes up. Yeah, Bosie, that's um, Oscar Wilde's mother. Oh, why Bosie? <laughs> that was his nickname, don't know. 
Oh, his name, his real name is Lord Gawain. What, Gavin? No, I, I made yeah. the mistake of looking for Gawain Douglas, and it comes up with Lord Gawain Archibald Francis Douglas, born in 1948. Oh, no. <laughs> okay, not him. Not him. No, he can't. Well, he's on Wikipedia as Gavin, and all the other sources I found hmm. had him as Gavin. Yeah, I don't have... There's no pictures or anything. He does not come up. How did you find him? <laughs> <laughs> no, I just Googled him. <laughs> but then I found quite a few other poetry sites that, that, that had him. Hmm. And then I, then I went through more books, books about Margaret and looked at all the, his uh, inclusions in that. And he pops up an awful lot. Oh, there we go. Found him. 1474 to 1522. Yeah. Oh, there's a statue of him. Yes, it's on the church. And there's one of William yeah. Dunbar as well, on the same church. Yeah, he's not a bad-looking guy. Well, at least from the statue's it. point of view. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah, from medieval church statues. They're not. They're all the same person, aren't they? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you for listening, thank and that was listening. our episode on Gavin Douglas, poet, and much else, and plague victim. A plague victim. Yeah, our very first. Yeah. Not going to be our last. <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye. Well, I meant to tell you, I don't know if you noticed, but I put a thing out on Facebook about us beaching 100,000. Somebody wrote back to say that our podcast was one of the great pleasures of life. Oh, yay! Yeah. In fact, he said you and I and the podcast were the three great pleasures of life. <laughs> oh, that's lovely. <laughs> Isn't it? Oh. Yes, I've made, made, really made my day that. Yeah. yeah. Right, let's get back to the people that don't make our day. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the marriage of Margaret and Angus put the Douglases firmly on the English side.